Welcome to the Catholic Community Scripture Study held at St. John the Evangelist Catholic Church in Jackson, Michigan. I will be your host, Todd Gale, as we walk our way through the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Hello, my friends, and welcome back. We're talking about the destruction of the second temple. We're talking about perhaps the end of the world. This is in Matthew chapter 24, where we pick up. Jesus has been talking about the signs of the end. And he says, don't follow false messiahs. There will be wars and famines and earthquakes, tribulation and, and, and persecution. Believers will be divided against each other. There will be more false teachers. The gospel will be preached throughout the whole world. There will be some sort of desolating sacrilege. Then the greatest tribulation and disaster strikes. And again, there will be false Christ, false prophets. There'll be a sign in the sky. And when you see these signs, you know the season is coming, kind of like the fig tree when it's in bloom. And the obvious sign will be the coming of the Son of Man. It will not be secret. Everyone will see this. So picking up in verse 36, Jesus says, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels. Only my Father in heaven knows, he says. No one knows. It seems like Jesus is, is going back to the original question in verse 3. What will be the sign of your coming? And, and his answer here is a little surprising. If, if Jesus is God, he's the second person of the Trinity, like how is it that there's something that God the Father knows that he doesn't know? Well, St. Paul tells us that Jesus humbled himself, emptied himself of some of, some of his godliness, of his divinity while here on earth. Um, this is part of the, of the willing giving up that Jesus did to become human, to live among us. Um, there's lots of different thoughts about this. There's a lot of theory, and it could be as simple as this is simply something Jesus, it's not his mission to uh, to inform us. That's It's not his job to do that. That's not what he's tasked with. But one, one of the things this shows us is the absolute craziness of later persons making predictions of the exact time and the exact season Jesus says, in general, watch. When you see the season approaching, right? When you see the season changing like that, when, when the fig tree is in bloom, then you'll know that it's coming. But the exact day, the exact details are not revealed. And then Jesus says, his coming will be like it was in the time of Noah, when, when the flood came to the world. Um, in the days of Noah, what he's saying is th things were just normal. People were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage as if nothing was going to happen. And we should also remember that in the days of Noah, this is what it says in chapter 6 of Genesis, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay, that's like three triple negatives. This is really bad. The New American, um, or the the New International Version, the NIB, NIV version of the Bible, there we go. It says that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. All right, so... It was incredibly wicked. There was, there was no one good except for Noah's family. They were warned and judgment came. And what Jesus is saying, it, the same kind of thing is going to happen. <clears throat> Two men will be in a field. One is taken and one is left. Two women at the mill. One is taken. One is left. Some of our evangelical friends who believe in the rapture, they'll say, see, one is taken away to heaven, and the other is left behind for the final tribulation. I'm not going to go in detail about uh, uh, about that. Um, 
that whole concept of the rapture. But no, Christians have usually, before the 1800s, we've always understood this to mean one thing only. And, and, and it's the way St. Luke tells us. The, the way to understand it is one is taken away, not taken away to heaven. The one that's taken away is taken away to death. Like the sinners in the flood, they're swept away by the flood. And the one that is left is the one that survives, like Noah. And we know this is the correct interpretation of that because Luke tells us in, in different words, Noah didn't understand until the flood took them all away, destroying them all. He's very clear that the one taken away dies because of sin. And the one that is saved is saved on the ark, right? <clears throat> but the main idea of this, no matter how you, how you want to turn that around, we don't know when exactly he's going to come. So be ready. Get your life in order. Turn to him. Don't wait, right? It's just going to, it's just going to happen in, in an instant. Now, we're going to go off on a massive tangent now. Um, I debated about whether or not to do this, and I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to, so I will. This is a grand overview. I could spend much more time on this, but a grand overview of seven different apparitions and, and um, prophecies that fit with the Olivet Discourse and all appear to be coming together. They're converging in our lifetime. It seems to be happening pretty soon. Now, I have to admit, this makes me nervous. I don't want it to sound like crazy end of the world prophecy stuff. And there's a tendency that most of us want morbid details. We want scandal. We want sensationalism. And there's a whole market whipped up of, uh, of Catholic frenzy out there on the internet for prophecies and visions. So on one hand, I want to be really careful because it's easy to get sucked into the stuff that, that we want to be true. I want those prophecies to all be true. But I'm going to try very hard to stick with things that's in total conformity with the church and that the church has formally approved. Okay. So on one hand, we want to be careful. But on the other hand, Jesus says clearly, when you see these signs, interpret them and understand what's happening. So... No matter what, the number one thing we do is we pray. That's the constant message throughout the Bible, and that's the message throughout all the apparitions and the prophecies. So there's a lot here. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Number one, the apparitions of Our Lady of Guadalupe in 1531 in what is today Mexico City. This is that amazing miracle where Our Lady left the unbelievable image printed on the poncho, on the tilma, on the cloak of St. Juan Diego. In Spanish, the word Guadalupe means the one who crushes the serpent. For Christians, we see this as a reference to, to Genesis chapter 3, where the woman's child is prophesied to crush the head of Satan. We know that to be Jesus. But to the Aztecs at the time of St. Juan Diego, it means she will crush the head of the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl, or however you say that, the feathered serpent who demanded human sacrifices. The best little short summary of this whole thing is from Bishop Andrew Cousins. He said, this is what I call the Guadalupe effect. When the Spanish missionaries showed up, they discovered a culture that entire religion was based on human sacrifice. The Spanish soldiers, the conquistadors, did help shutting down those sacrifices, but they also abused the Aztec people, terribly so. And they committed all sorts of atrocities against the Aztecs. So, of course, the native people didn't want to join the religion of the Spaniards. But we have a letter written by the bishop, Juan de Zumaraga, first bishop of Mexico, and he tried to get the king of Spain to discipline the soldiers. And he told them the situation had become so desperate. If there was not help from heaven itself, we will lose everything. Three months later, 
our Blessed Mother Mary appeared to Juan Diego. And the largest conversion of a people group in the history of the world took place. Before Guadalupe, some maybe 200,000 Native Americans had been baptized and, and joined Christ. Among them were Juan Diego and his wife. But between the time of the apparitions and when Juan Diego died and when, when Bishop Juan died, seven to nine million Native Americans were baptized. Millions. In the next hundred years, Mexico became one of the most densely populated Catholic countries in the world. Okay, so number one, I want you to remember the Guadalupe effect. When things are at their worst, Mary steps in and miracles happen. Number two, Pope Leo XIII and the Hundred Years. On October 13th, I want you to remember that day, October 13th of 1884, Pope Leo XIII was celebrating Mass. He collapsed and he had had a vision a vision of Satan approaching the throne of God. And Satan asked Jesus to give him a hundred years to prove to him that he could destroy the church and that he would have power over the world and he would destroy us. And the Lord granted Satan a hundred years. Pope Leo woke up from this trance and he wrote the St. Michael prayer. And he wrote 10 encyclicals on Mary. And he tells us we have to act as the church militant, right? And, and we have to use our greatest power, our greatest weapon to storm the evils of the world. And what is that greatest weapon? He said, let us have recourse to Mary, our holy sovereign. So I want you to remember this, a hundred years. And he's, he's, he's asking us to really turn to Mary. Then number three, Our Lady of Fatima in Portugal, 1917. I think most of you know this story. The three children were, were out tending sheep. Mary appears and urges them to, to pray, to pray for penance, for the conversion of sinners, and, and a consecration of Russia. Now, this is the biggest of the visions. This is the, the biggest of the miracles. So she came several times. But it was on October 13th, oh, remember that date, 1917, when her final vision came, when there was this amazing miracle of the sun. And I'm not going to go into detail about that. You can look that up. It was exactly 33 years after Saint Pope, or after Pope Leo the 13th had his vision. October 13th, 1917, 33 years after Pope Leo saw that Satan was going to be given a hundred years to reign. Now, one of those three children, Lucia, she became a nun. She died in 2005 at the age of 97. She had been interviewed many, many times. But some of these are recorded. We can see them. She's, she wrote a book in 1941. Um, and she revealed a lot. She talked with Pope St. Pope John Paul II many, many times. And she made it, it made it clear that God wishes to establish the world to a devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And that if the requests are not heeded for, for repentance and for conversion and for prayer, then Russia will spread her errors throughout the world. She also said, but in the end, no matter what, my immaculate heart will triumph. There will be a period of peace granted to the world. Hmm. An era of peace. Now, St. John the Evangelist in the book of Revelation does talk about an era of, of, of the reign of Christ for a thousand years. And some people think that is the era in which Mary was talking about. But the big thing here is that Russia will spread its errors. Now this happened in 1917, literally just days after these first visions, Lenin's revolution took Russia into the evils of Marxism and communism. 
some will say, and I, and I really am starting to believe this, exactly 33 years after Pope Leo had a vision that 100 years would be granted to Satan, 33 years later is when Russia began to move and when Mary shows up to give us some comfort and some direction and some strategy. So many people believe the 100-year countdown began with Fatima in 1917, and it began with a bang. There's still a promise of an era of peace, still a promise that the Immaculate Heart would reign. Number four is the Divine Mercy with St. Faustina. Around 1930, this Polish nun had amazing conversations with Jesus, and Jesus asked her to speak to the world about mercy. Um, he said, you're going to prepare the world for my final coming. And he said, before I come as a judge, I first open wide the doors of mercy. And if anyone refuses to walk through the door of my mercy, they must pass through the door of my justice. And then Jesus told her especially, I bear a special love for Poland. And if she will be obedient to my will, I will exalt her in might and holiness. From her, from Poland, will come forth the spark that will prepare the world for my final coming. So says Jesus to Faustina. Some believe that spark that came from Poland was Karol Wojtyla, Wojtyla, however you say his name, who we know as St. Pope John Paul II, right? That he would prepare the world with this message of divine mercy. And in 2016, Pope Francis declared the year of mercy with literally having doors of mercy marked at parishes and cathedrals worldwide almost a hundred years later. The fifth one is Garabendel, Spain. Uh, some folks have not heard of this one. This apparition has not been approved by the church. It was denied at first and then looked at again. It's okay to have a devotion for this. It's okay to have a pilgrimage there, but the church has not put a final stamp of approval on this particular um, apparition because of some of the things that are open. But the reason I'm including it is because of the people who did believe in this. So between 1961 and 1965, now we're entering into our era, right? Most of us, at least many of us, like, right, with, know about this era of time. There were four girls in a little hamlet of Garabandel in northern Spain. This is in a mountainous, mountainous region. It's enclosed. If I, if I recall, they didn't even get electricity there until the 1960s. Um, this was a very backwards, very uneducated farming kind of community. And there were four girls who, who similarly saw Mary. And two of them were 11 years old, two were 12 years old. Three of the girls are still alive. Two of them live in the United States. And even though the church has not formally approved this yet, this is why I think it's okay to talk about. St. Padre Pio thought they were wonderful and wrote a letter to them that we still have. St. John Paul II and St. Jose Maria uh, Marie Escriva, St. Jose Marie Escriva met with them, talked with them. They would not have have risked their reputation if this was not really solid. But the greatest one of all, I think this is very interesting, St. Teresa of Calcutta. Mother Teresa is the godmother of one of the girl's kids, right? One of the girls named Conchita, who, who saw this vision. Mother Teresa got to know her and she became the godmother of her daughter. Okay, so this tells me there was something going on in Garabandel. In the first messages in 1961, the, the seers were told, we must lead good lives. If not, a chastisement will come. The cup is filling up. And if we don't change, a great chastisement will come upon us. Does that sound familiar? And according to the visionaries, there'll be a period of great tribulation. 
which is going to specifically begin when Russia unexpectedly invades part of the free world. The girls were, were told the tribulation would involve the return of communism. Now, this is one of the reasons this has a lot of weight. These girls didn't even know what communism was. When Mary told them of this, they were pretty much totally uneducated. They did not know anything about what was going on in Russia, and they didn't know about communism, let alone communism leaving, which it hadn't done yet, and communism kind of returning to take over the world. This seems a little bizarre because they didn't know anything about it. And then after this period of war and persecution, they said there will be, they, they were told there would be a correction of conscience where almost everyone in the world will, give, will be given a revelation of the state of their soul. This has been called the illumination of conscience. There's a little cottage industry that's grown up around a book called The Warning. And some th think this, this warning, this, this, this last act of, of divine mercy is the exact thing that um, St. Faustina was talking about. That the Lord will give everyone an oppor opportunity to see the truth, to see their sin, right? And give them one more opportunity to change. This is the divine mercy door closing. What's really interesting is that in multiple interviews, the girls went into great detail about this. All their stories always matched, right? Um, through the years, they haven't changed their stories. It's been very, very consistent. And, and Our Lady told them things that they just did not know back in their time. Our Lady also told Conchita that the prophecies would come to pass at a time when there was an important synod being held in the church. Now, in 1960s, in the early 60s, nobody had ever heard of a synod because Pope Paul VI hadn't established the Synod of Bishops until 1965. It was just two months before the very final apparition of Garabandel. There's no way word would have gotten from Rome to this little Spanish community so that the girls would hear about a synod. They were asked over and over again, do you mean council? Because the Vatican II council was starting and was going on during some of these visions. Did, do you mean a council? And Conchita said, no. No, Mother said specifically a synod. Well, what's a synod? I don't know. I just know what Mother told us. I think it's like a small council. And the visionary stated that one of the signs that this tribulation would come, that the warning is close at hand, is when churches around the world will be closed. And the faithful would be prevented from receiving the sacraments. <clears throat> now that had never happened in 2,000 years of church history until 2020. And today the international community, the UN, the WHO, they're very publicly making plans for worldwide shutdowns for another pandemic and for environmental crises and all sorts of other things. This one's very interesting. Then number six, Our Lady of Akita in Japan, Sister Agnes Sasagawa. In 1973, Sister Agnes saw a brilliant light coming from the tabernacle. She began to bleed profusely. She had apparitions from Mary and a, and a wooden statue in the convent began to weep oil from the eyes, and there are pictures of this. This made worldwide news. This is the 1970s, right? It wept on 101 occasions. I want you to remember that, 101. But also Our Lady spoke to Agnes. And the last word she said to her was on, guess which date, October 13th in 1973. The same day as the Fatima miracle of the sun, the same day as Pope Leo's vision of the hundred years. 
Our Lady said, as I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the great deluge, the flood, such as one will never see, has never seen before. Fire will fall from the sky. Said, Mary told Sister Agnes, the work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops. The church will be full of those who accept compromises. Now, when Sister Agnes first had these visions, the church did not believe this. The bishops didn't believe this because they never thought they would see the day when cardinals would be opposing cardinals and bishops opposing bishops. But we know that shortly after that, the news broke of terrible scandals in the worldwide church. And today we are seeing incredible splits between our bishops as they're arguing and defending and moving and whatever it is that they're doing, right? There's great division among the leadership of the church today. And the final one is number seven, Our Lady of Medjugorje. Now, it's very similar to some of the other apparitions. Mary has visited six young visionaries in Medjugorje, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which at one time was Yugoslavia, right? And it was on, it's been ongoing since 1981. Some of these six uh, young people are still receiving visions. And the message of Medjugorje was very similar, a call to conversion a call back to, to, to prayer and fasting and confession in the Eucharist. And Our Lady's purpose for coming is to guide us because the time of destruction is, is, is near. A decision point is now, she keeps saying, and it's becoming urgent. Our Lady has appeared in Medjugorje since June of 1981 to the present. And after 40 plus years, Our Lady is still appearing. And um, there's, there's lots of secrets and lots of messages that have been given out. One of the, um, the seers, who's, who's now, uh, I believe, in her late 50s, um, is Merjana. And Merjana said, I, I can't tell you much about the secrets, but I will say this. Our Lady is planning on changing the world. She did, did not come to announce destruction. She came to save us. And with our son, she will triumph over evil. Ah, there will be an era of maybe peace. There will be a reign of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, there's a priest involved who is tasked with revealing some of these secrets to the world. And, and some of the recent messages in the last year or so, it's starting to sound urgent, like this is coming very, very soon. Um, but the good news is that if we continue to intercede and pray, there might be a lessening of the tribulations. In fact, uh, Merjana was told one of the, of the 10 secrets, I think it's number seven, is supposedly great detail about the great tribulation. And part of that has been completely removed because of the faithful response of people who have returned to prayer and are turning their lives around and repenting. So the final thing with this, the thing that kind of ties it all up for me, Sister Agnes in Japan, remember her, the weeping statue from the 1970s? She's still alive. And she had no other message from Our Lady until October 13th of 2019 just a couple years ago, October 13th. It was the same day as Pope Leo's vision, Fatima's last vision, and when St. Agnes received the very first vision of Our Lady in the 1970s. The day before she had this visit from Mary, a powerful typhoon, Hagabus, slammed into northern Japan, one of the strongest and largest typhoons ever recorded. 
but Sister Agnes was unharmed. It was the day of the formal start of the Amazon Synod. Now we talked a little bit about Pachamama and the Amazon Synod in a, in a previous uh, episode here, um, but no matter how it gets reported or or um, which side you're on, or if you think it's good or it's bad, what is definitely happening, and, and especially because of the synod, synod, is that we're seeing bishop against bishop, and priest against priest, and cardinal against cardinal. The church is dividing. Now here's what I find interesting. This is 102 years after Fatima, after the 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 miracle of the sun. And St. Agnes heard her guardian angel in a private message. It wasn't, I'm sorry if I said it was Mary speaking to her. It wasn't Mary speaking to her. It was, it was her angel. And her angel told her this was the message in 2019. Cover in ashes and please pray the penitential rosary every day. So as we look at what's happening in scripture, what Jesus says is happening in the end times, we look at the epistles and the letters that talk about tribulation and coming fires and um, there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. And we see the Guadalupe effect. When things look lost, Mary comes. We see that Satan get, got a hundred years. Russia will spread its evil, but there will still be an era of peace. God is, is right now extending a time of mercy before judgment. Russia will return, the churches will be closed, and a great synod will all be signs of the great tribulation and the warning. And a great tribulation will, will be fire from the sky and the church will divide. Right? Um, I clearly see, I think, this is my opinion, we see the signs of our age. And once again, we only know the season. As Jesus said, we don't know the exact date. We don't know the details. But we can tell the season is coming. Is it a seven-year thing? Is it 70 years? Is it 700 years? We, we don't know. But here's what really ties the whole thing together for me. Remember when I said I believe that the 100-year reign of Satan started maybe in 1917 with Fatima. That puts 2017 as the end of that century, of that hundred years. The end of 2017, the era ends. But maybe that hundred years was kind of symbolic. Maybe it wasn't exactly 100. Do you remember how many times did the Akita statue of Mary weep? How many times did... Did, and we have photographs and video and film of this. How many times did that statue weep? 101 times. Now call me crazy, call me a sensationalist, but if Mary's statue cried 101 times for the 101 years, that would bring us to 2018. And remember that that full year is inclusive of 2018. So the next era would begin in 2019. Satan had 100 years plus one. 2019 begins a new era. The year of great tribulation. In 2019, I don't know how many Americans know this, but plagues of locusts in Africa led to incredible famine. And this is like a biblical plague. Locusts destroyed crops in two or three major countries in Africa. 2019 was the start of the COVID outbreak and some very handed, heavy-handed government institutionalization, which comes a lot from communism, a lot of communist regime. The Notre Dame Cathedral burned. That's kind of symbolic, huh? There were many ac accusations of heresy pointed at the bishops and the cardinals and the pope. 2019 is when this really got ramped up. Right? 
if you if you take a look look on the internet all the events that happened in 2019 it's really startling it's truly startling but remember the guadalupe effect when things look lost mary intercedes we understand the bishop of hungary planted thousands of miraculous medals along the border between the Ukraine and Hungary as they prepare for a defensive position and, and praying against the evil spread of communism. St. Louis de Montfort foresaw that in the time of the, of the Great Tribulation, heroic priests will rise up to face the tyranny and they will be lovers of Our Lady. And according to Fatima, no matter what happens, after this period of tribulation, there will be an era of peace. Some have called it living in the divine will, a Eucharistic reign, the era of the, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Right? Some believe the world will convert and become Catholic. Bishop Fulton Sheen believed the entire Muslim world will convert to Catholicism. And we'll see the greatest miracle since the resurrection. Genuine world peace. An era like Eden. But this will only happen after a great time of distress. A great tribulation. And just as what happened to the Jews and their temple, and the destruction of their whole lifestyle, the destruction of everything they know, right? That's going to repeat for the world. And it's going to be a really rough time. It's a time of great tribulation. But on the other end of that, at the under end of that, is a guarantee of an era of peace. And at the very end of that, somewhere along the line, there's a guarantee of new heavens and new earth and the return of Jesus. And that's what we have to listen to. And I, I rather, that's what we have to look forward to. That's what we, we get to pray for. That's what we get to hope for. I hope this wasn't scary and unsettling. And I hope it wasn't over the top uh, with too much prophecy and kind of, you know, sensationalism. But I hope that we're prepared and I hope that we pray. And I hope that we do what Mary has been begging us to do and what Jesus has asked from the beginning. Pray for thy kingdom to come and thy will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Next week when we pick up, we will pick up scripture again. And Jesus will talk about more about this idea of being ready for when this time comes. Being ready and prepared. Amen. Thanks for joining me, everyone. I love you so much. Thanks. God bless. Thank you so much for walking the way through the Gospel of Matthew. 